past 24 months, we've seen a lot happening in the healthcare industry. A, consolidation and mergers. Never before we've seen such large scale mergers and acquisitions happening in this space, which has and will affect the common man on street. B, Dr. Amazon. Yes, Amazon is flexing its distribution financial muscle to get in the healthcare space. And Alessa, as we all know, is helping to connect the home with the doctor or a pharmacy. And C, last but not the least, the rise of artificial intelligence, which has positively affected patient care and artificial intelligence operations, which is being leveraged to support critical patient care infrastructure. Today's topic is on artificial intelligence-led IT operations for enhanced patient healthcare, a very important topic. And to speak about it, we have with us Mr. Uday Madasu, Chief Information Officer of Jewish Boards. For folks who do not know about Jewish Board, it is New York City's largest social services agency, which strengthens families and communities by helping individuals of all backgrounds realize their potential and live as independently as possible. Uday is a senior technology and operations leader in the healthcare management space with a special focus on finance, systems, operations, corporate compliance, and performance management and improvement. We would like to apologize that Mr. Doug Brown, who was supposed to join this webcast, uh, will not be able to join us. He's the president of Black Book uh, because of unavoidable circumstances. Um, for folks who have joined in, you can always post your questions in the chat bar, which we will try and address during this webcast. With this, I'd like to hand it over to Uday. Uday, please. Thank you, Ananda. Um, I'm hoping everybody can uh, hear us. Um, if the audio is not clear, uh, I'm hoping that uh, one of the organizers can uh, use the chat to uh, uh, make a note of it. So very excited to be here. Um, I'm uh, hoping that everyone, just like me, is looking forward to a pleasant spring after some extreme weather across our country. Um, I want to start today's presentation um, with a, just a brief review of some uh, recent mega mergers in our uh, healthcare, pharma, and life sciences uh, industry that uh, indicate a trend towards vertical integration of diverse stakeholders who have aligned incentives, large complementary data sets, and combined assets, which I truly think have the potential to disrupt our uh, healthcare market. So as uh, hospital leaders, we can't just wait and see what uh, comes next, but we have to anticipate possible activity we have to forecast potential impact to our uh, businesses, and we have to create a plan uh, to prepare and take action. Uh, a few examples that uh, I want to highlight here are um, Cigna and Express Scripts, um, and their merger will help consolidate divisions not only internally, and uh, they'll learn from their efficiencies, but the overall hope is that this merger will greatly help reduce costs of uh, healthcare, which ultimately will uh, benefit the patients. Uh, the next example is about Bristol-Myers Squibb and uh, Celgene, uh, and their merger is going to enhance scale to create better and newer products, but those ultimately and hopefully will uh, enhance patient care. And the last example um, is that around CVS Health and Aetna, and we are hoping that their merger will truly transform consumer health experience by making care more localized, less expensive, and more accessible, keeping in line with the uh, AAA. So these are just a few examples of uh, mergers. There are many, many more mergers that are happening also within the provider side of the market and, uh, and then interesting partnerships in the healthcare industry, which I think will all bring innovative solutions um, into the market. So with that said, uh, what should uh, agencies or hospitals do? So as we all think about digital transformation, being able to scale digitally really requires thinking differently and transforming 
the way we manage IT infrastructure and IT operations. Um, so to meet the challenges of scaling digital transformation, IT infrastructure and operations must become very adaptive. Uh, because an adaptive IT organization can help accelerate the rest of its uh, business, and it can change direction as demand changes, and it can flex between different modes of business collaboration based on uh, context of care. Uh, we hear about digitiza digitization, e-commerce, Internet of Things, mobile technologies, um, and a whole slew of other newer technologies that are all shrinking the business cycles, which then create need for agile responses from IT. Technology has truly changed the way businesses compete. To be successful, IT will need to empower the businesses to scale efficiently, profitably, and sustainably, both from the data center all the way to the edge where care is delivered. Business processes have to become more dynamic. Business management decisions have to be made in real time. And people at the edge who are delivering care have to be empowered with instant insight. Uh, I now want to take a few minutes to highlight some examples of where artificial intelligence is being used in healthcare. Uh, the first example I have is we now have across one state in the country over a half a dozen clinics, outpatient clinics, that are actually set up within large supermarkets that are completely driven by artificial intelligence. Starting from the time when patients are coming into the clinic and they use smartphones or tablets to update their demographic information, capture financial information, and then when they, when they are in the room, um, augmented reality is being used to instruct the patients to use different medical devices to collect uh, vital statistics, whether it is their uh, temperature, blood pressure, height, weight, what have you. Uh, and then all of the workup is automatically sent uh, electronically to different providers who are not necessarily in the room, but telemedicine is being leveraged to uh, create a consult using audio and video so that the, uh, the information that is being captured can be verified the diagnosis can be confirmed, and then the provider can patient can have a conversation around what they think is the appropriate service or treatment plan. This entire process drastically reduces the amount of time it takes to provide a session. Uh, the average time in this model is 15 to 20 minutes, um, with the added advantage that all of the data that is being captured is automatically entered or updated into an electronic health record type of a system uh, and billing is done automatically. Imagine that and what that model would do fundamentally to change the way healthcare is practiced and delivered in this country. The next example I have is probably one that many of us can relate to as we are using Siri or Alexa or uh, Google in our uh, homes and in our lives. This is the uh, ability to use patient-centered voice assistance so that we can really improve the inpatient hospital experience um, and give the patient's ability to just search the web, inquire about weather, control TV and other electronic devices in their room. They can learn more about the organization. They can ask questions about their care, their caregiver. They can understand uh, what is going on with their diagnosis, their medication, their treatment plan. They can order food. So being able to really transform the experience of the patient as they are in a location that initially may be not very comfortable, but eventually could begin to feel like they are at home. Uh, that dramatically will change the way we experience care in our day-to-day -day lives. Another example where artificial intelligence is being, being used very successfully is around uh, imaging. Um, this is a promising area because deep learning algorithms are much better and faster than human beings at perceptual tasks, especially as far as uh, imaging goes. A great example is uh, around echocardiograms can, that can be much easily and uh, quickly classified using deep learning. 
the next example is using machine learning for patient risk stratification. As we think about pre and post discharge, and we think about how to stratify risk around our clients and come up with patient work lists, machine learning is very helpful because it can look at multiple variables and help with pre and post discharge uh, that then will lead in uh, timely communications between providers and uh, patients, between providers and other providers. Um, and we can do things very quickly and easily around things like following up and setting up primary care appointments, um, which also will help improve the way we deliver care for our clients and ultimately and hopefully reduce readmissions into the hospitals. The last example I have um, is around uh, using AI for uh, cancer and uh, chemotherapy. This is an interesting one because most people who undergo chemotherapy report common symptoms which uh, are around a feeling of nausea, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, drowsiness, dry mouth, heart flashes, numbness, and nervousness. So a group of researchers tried to group all of these different symptoms into three key networks. Uh, those were occurrence, severity, and distress. And using network analysis, the researchers were able to identify nausea as the central symptom which also impacted symptoms across all three networks. This detailed and integrated analysis is crucial in planning treatment for future patients and helping better manage their symptoms across, healthcare, uh, across their healthcare journey. So those were a couple of examples I wanted to use to highlight how artificial intelligence is being used in uh, healthcare, and hopefully we'll hear more and more success stories like this. I, want, I now want to focus a little bit on what uh, Aninda referred to with uh, Dr. Amazon. Uh, I think we are not that far where Dr. Amazon or Dr. Alexa can do a much better job than most primary care providers are able to across our country, um, especially using all of the tools and technologies that Amazon and uh, Alexa will have access to. Um, in the recent uh, past, Amazon has introduced three new HIPAA-compatible technologies into the market, Amazon Translate, Amazon Transcribe, and Amazon Comprehend, which all use machine learning and include capabilities like speech-to-text and language translations, which ultimately will help better streamline customer support and improve patient engagement. Uh, as Aninda referred to, Amazon is investing a lot of resources in healthcare, including their much-publicized partnership with two other large players in the, uh, in the market, to crack the healthcare code, and we all hope that they are uh, successful because the rest of us can uh, benefit from it. Um, other examples of what Amazon is doing in uh, healthcare, they run their own clinics for their staff because they think they can do a much better job of managing the way care is delivered and, uh, and uh, cost of care is managed. They acquired a full-service pharmacy company so that they can do a better job of managing prescription medications for customers by optimizing, packaging, organizing, and delivering the medications. You can imagine what Amazon has done to the supply chain market. Uh, Amazon has introduced a cloud-based platform that will give pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and uh, academic scientific institutions access to research data that will help inform decisions at the early stage drug development and other healthcare initiatives. They've partnered with software providers that can mine patient health records. Um, we have a lot of useful and interesting information that is captured in uh, electronic health records, but often we struggle in trying to understand what all of it means. So hopefully with uh, Amazon's help, we can learn better how to mine the uh, patient health records for data that will really help physicians improve their uh, service plans and treatment plans and ultimately help providers cut costs of delivering care. Uh, they really, I'm hoping, will soon have a product that can do a much, much better job of delivering primary care in our country. With that said, it's not all nice uh, and feel good. There are definitely things that each organization has to keep in mind. There are some uh, considerations 
um, as you are thinking about implementing or using uh, artificial intelligence in your agency in a successful way. We all, I think, can agree that from a patient perspective and a consumer perspective, AI is definitely going to empower them. Uh, and for providers and uh, healthcare systems, AI is going to augment clinicians and hopefully bridge gaps. However, here are a, a couple of key considerations that I would urge all of you to think about and keep in mind. The first one is really making sure we have a good game plan of proving the value and understanding the potential impact of an AI-based solution to an organization, its staff, and patients, because it can mean different things for different uh, agencies and different care settings. Uh, the other thing then to think about is, are there clinical workflow adjustments that we have to make to get the most out of an AI-based solution? Change is not easy. People get used to doing things a certain way, and when you implement these new and innovative solutions, we really have to think about how is it going to impact their workflow. Uh, we also have to think about who are the stakeholders at an organization that are best equipped to enable the success of an AI-based solution. Maybe it's not for everybody that is delivering care. Maybe there are some people that can make most out of uh, AI-based solutions. Lastly, uh, but very importantly, how do we communicate the AI-based solution and its success uh, and continue to leverage it as an asset across the agency? So these are some considerations to think about. I'm sure you all can think of other considerations um, as you're thinking about artificial intelligence. There's a whole conversation about ethics um, around uh, artificial intelligence, but these are things that I wanted to highlight for you guys. So with all of this said, as we at uh, the Jewish Board are continuously trying to think about how to improve our ability to better serve our clients. We definitely want to leverage technology as a major asset. We have made lots of investments, and we have come a long way in being, being able to push the envelope using technology in the way we deliver uh, services to our clients and how we can improve the outcomes for our clients. So our IT strategy at a high level consists of these four elements, uh, definitely focused on a cloud-first strategy, focuses on speed and agility to support our businesses, and uh, also improve our client experience. Clients, both the clients our agency serves, and internally, the staff that are also clients for our IT team. The next uh, part of our IT strategy focuses on not just modernization, but really trying to simplify the way IT infrastructure is implemented so that it really can be offered as a service for consumption across everybody in the agency, and that it's really easy to understand, easy to use. Um, as we implement lots of uh, clinical, financial, and operational systems, we are collecting a ton of data. So being able to really understand how to use data is at the core of our IT strategy. We want to use data and uh, leverage analytics, business intelligence to drive day-to-day -day business decisions. Who is delivering care? How is care being delivered? Where is it being delivered? Um, and, we, and part of that strategy also led us to using newer technologies. So we uh, recently implemented an AI ops and automation-led uh, strategy as part of our IT infrastructure that we are very excited about that I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later in the presentation. Now, as we are thinking about using more and more technology, we are very aware and uh, focused, and we constantly try to ensure that we are integrating cybersecurity into all of our IT strategy and operations because we want to continuously monitor and detect and prevent, ideally, any security incidents, and, uh, and we provide a lot of training to our staff uh, to make sure that everybody is doing their part in trying to protect our agency staff and client information. So as we do everything with the IT strategy as the anchor, uh, a couple of things I want to highlight uh, in terms of our approach towards both a stable and also an agile IT operational environment. So these are a few things that we have done. Uh, first thing is we partnered with an IT managed services provider that provides end-to-end -end IT operations and management, including cybersecurity as a service. The second thing we've done is really 
um, using our cloud first strategy. We've implemented lots of clinical financial and operational applications, but we've really taken advantage of both a, a private cloud and a public cloud, and in some cases a hybrid cloud option, especially for our mission critical applications like our electronic health record system, our billing and accounting system, our HR and payroll system. And we are also using the cloud um, for a very obvious use case, which is to maintain an offsite backup of all of our data. Um, we are using a virtualized high performance computer and storage infrastructure in a co-located data center, which is supported by a widely distributed voice and data network. Our agency, although we are focused in the five boroughs of New York City, because we are a community-based uh, social services agency, we deliver care at over 65 locations across the uh, city. So it's very important for us to think about how people at the 60 plus locations are consuming compute and storage resources. Uh, we've implemented an AI ops and automation engine uh, using a framework that is uh, really helping support and optimize our IT operations. And as I mentioned, we use analytics every day to drive decision making process, whether it is within IT and IT service uh, optimization, or also in our day to day business functions whether it is social workers or psychiatrists who are trying to understand what can they do to really ensure that the work that they are doing is resulting in a meaningful outcome for our clients. Um, I'll talk a little more about um, some uh, use cases of where we are using automation and uh, some benefits that we accrued. Um, as you can imagine, being a uh, healthcare agency, community-based healthcare agency, a big component of our uh, annual operating expense is attributed to uh, labor cost between salaries and benefits. So anything that we can do that will help automate things that people have to do is much appreciated. Uh, a couple of use cases where we are trying to leverage automation is at a very basic level being able to very quickly and rapidly onboard new employees, being able to provision system access, but at the same time maintain role-based security, make sure that we are following the least privilege uh, as we are giving people access to different systems. We use a lot of automation across multiple systems for data validation uh, within different workflows within systems so that we can maintain what we call a golden thread of uh, clinical documentation or other business processes. Uh, another small example where we are using automation is around processing claims and remittances and also eligibility inquiries so that people don't have to wait to take steps. Uh, rather, we use automation to drive certain workflows so that people can focus on exceptions or people can uh, focus on doing other things that will help improve their uh, productivity. Um, as you can see, uh, these examples of automation definitely yield in lots of benefits. I'm highlighting a couple of benefits here. Uh, the first one is our ability to deliver consistent quality with very high level of effectiveness, which is, which is very important, especially in healthcare, where your margin of error is not that high. Um, and our ability to handle much higher throughput and redeploy resources that can then enhance productivity. Uh, as you can imagine, Retention and recruitment is a big problem in the healthcare industry. There are acute examples of shortages of valuable resources in the uh, industry, whether it is uh, psychiatrists, child psychiatrists, nursing staff. And it's not something that is unique to Jewish Board. This is a problem that is pervasive across the healthcare industry, worse in certain geographical areas than others. So to be able to redeploy those resources and to be able to leverage technology to enhance their productivity is much needed. Uh, the last benefit is to be able to ideally mitigate and prevent incidents, if not at least to be able to fix them proactively so that we can minimize uh, downtime and uh, really maintain uptime for all of our systems so that they can be used effectively by our providers. Um, so with that said, uh, we use the, uh, uh, an approach that is based on uh, AI ops in our IT infrastructure. Um, we use a solution called uh, Gavel. Here are some um, features of this solution. 
one of the things that I like as a CIO of the organization where I often have to consume and digest lots of data, this tool gives me a unified dashboard that is really doing a great job of collating data from multiple sources and being able to do event correlation. It helps us do root cause analysis and then being able to do predictive analytics so that we can really understand what's going on in our environment, where things have to be optimized, where things have to be uh, uh, improved. Uh, and then it does a really good job of reducing noise in our environment. Um, it also has a virtual supervisor and can give us a good indication of our customer perception index so that we can, as an IT support operation, continuously look at how, what we can do to improve the way we serve our clients. Um, this is a tool that uh, I'm talking about. We use a tool called uh, Gavel. And uh, here are some um, uh, uh, examples where it has really made an impact in our organization. Goes without saying that it has changed the way we use computing resources, resources at our agency. Uh, for us, these resources are not uh, plentiful. These are uh, scarce resources. So we are glad that we are able to optimize how we utilize these resources. Eliminating false positives. As I said, as you're monitoring and managing multiple systems and tons of infrastructure, we get a lot of noise. To, so to be able to use Gavel to eliminate false positives really makes a big difference. And we are able to eliminate false positives close to 75% of the times using event correlation, which then frees up critical resources that can address other critical activities. It does a really good job of effective root cause identification, which then leads to proactive remediation of events. And uh, the, the, the ultimate benefit for us is to really help infrastructure uptime um, almost by 80%, because we are a 24-7 operation, as is most healthcare in our country, especially on the um, you know, uh, acute care and emergency care side. We are not an acute care and emergency care, but a lot of our programs are run 24-7. So maintaining uptime, improving uptime is very critical, and uh, that is what Gavel was able to uh, help us with. So in closing uh, for my presentation today, uh, I'm very excited about the possibility of continuing to use AI at our agency, uh, and we are hoping to use it to help our staff and clients. And we look forward to working with all of our partners to leverage technology to improve the way care is accessed across the agency in our community, uh, improving the quality of care, and uh, hopefully in uh, some way uh, to be able to manage the cost of care. With that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, I think you know, I learned a lot in this process, and you know, the amount of technology that goes in the healthcare space, you know, the merger of cutting technologies, AI ops and um, you know a holistic platform like Gavel, you know how it helps in enhancing healthcare. So thank you for that. Um, at this moment, uh, I would request um, you know folks who have tuned in, if you have any questions, you can use the chat box for your questions. Um, we are joined by Mr. Chandra Moleshwaran, who is a senior vice president and head of infrastructure services for GAV. So he can also answer any questions that you might have and between Uday and Chandra they can figure out you know who would be the best person to ask your question. Um, as we speak Uday there's one question uh, which is there and I wanted to ask this to you maybe this is for you. Uh, the question is what are the security concerns in implementing AI ops uh, which is the automation platform specifically if the automation touches the clinical systems and workflows. Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's a good question and uh, definitely falls in line with one of the core pillars of our uh, IT strategy around uh, cybersecurity. So currently, as we are using Gavel in our agency, we collect a lot of monitoring or performance data, which doesn't necessarily include uh, PHI or uh, PII. Um, so that's one we are not yet feeding, uh, for example, into Gavel data from our electronic health record system. So with that said, there are many, many ways 
to secure uh, data when you are using these systems, right? So we can use common practices like encrypted communication, providing right. read-only access, uh, being very careful about using a public cloud. So these are some easy and quick steps that we can think about as we implement these solutions. But mm -hmm. if you are using an AI app solution that uh, uh, covers handling PHI or PII, we definitely have to pay a little more attention and make sure that there are no vulnerabilities um, you know, that can be exploited. But we are not there yet, so this is something that uh, we are going to figure out and uh, definitely pay more attention to as we go into the future. Right, right, right. Well, that was pretty insightful. <clears throat> the second question that we have is, is there a consistency or a reliability issue with allowing AI ops engine in identifying a potential problem uh, and or execution? Sure. So as you guys know, uh, when you're uh, talking about deep learning, machine learning, the more the data and uh, a little bit of time, I think the better the uh, self-learning capabilities. Uh, and then with that comes an improved uh, reliability. But it takes time. Uh, this is, uh, you know, and, and during this period, there is a little bit of human intervention. It's not all uh, machines uh, magically doing their thing. We, uh, after all, have to control them. So we got to get it, get, you know, we have to get, be involved. We have to intervene. And we really have to help, uh, at least initially, the machines learn the correct things and sometimes unlearn the incorrect things. Um, and, but the, the beauty of this process is once it is automated, right. uh, then the yeah. machine can follow a very successful methodology that's tried and tested and with 100% consistency yeah. until we decide to make a change. Yeah. Right? One of the beauties of this is these machines hopefully will not call out sick. They'll do what we need them to do 24-7, 365. Right. You know, that's very powerful, actually. Um, um, the third question that we have is, at the time we are talking about patient experience and patient satisfaction, uh, will not the AI of, you know, the AI of platform alienate the provider-patient relationship if allowed to get involved in the business workflows and operations? That's a great question, and uh, you know this uh, also has uh, other sort of concerns for people. Uh, sometimes people, I think, have a uh, unfortunate perception that uh, with AI and machine learning, all of us are going to be out of jobs. I don't think that is quite the case, and it really depends on how uh, AI apps is being implemented in uh, any agency. In our agency, we are currently using AI ops to manage all of our IT infrastructure, which uh, helped us in creating a very robust IT uh, systems uh, infrastructure, which ultimately is helping enhance our uh, provider and client experience. Um, as we think about implementing AI ops to analyze all of our patient data uh, in, in an effort to help uh, outcomes, I think we'll have to think really about what that does to the provider and patient relationship. Uh, but being able to predict an onset of a disease based on data from the past, um, being able to prevent bad incidents for our clients using what we already know about them, what we can learn more about them, uh, all of this actually, I think, improves the way providers and patients interact, and uh, it actually enhances the trust between the providers and patients. So I think AI ops um, should be considered a tool that right. needs definitely to be implemented alongside to help improve decision-making process and enrich the user experience. And it should not be looked as a tool that replaces a provider and patient interaction um, or the relationship. Right. I think you've put it very well. I mean, there's this... <laughs> The entire industry is talking about how AI will be replacing human beings, but I think you've put it in perspective that you know humans and machines need to work hand in hand for enhancement in their business. Um, with this, uh, there's another question we come out, and I'm not sure if uh, you know maybe Chandra, if you would like to pick this up, um, say that how will this tool function in remote areas, uh, especially where there's no internet or there's low bandwidth.
Chandrakhe there. Hi, this is uh, hi, this is Chandramouli sir. Um, so I take care of um, uh, IP products and uh, IMS practice for gas technologies. So, Anindya, your question uh, here is uh, how this will work in case of remote areas where the bandwidth is lower, right? Yeah. So, just um, yeah. Um, so there has to be some sort of connectivity, maybe even a lower bandwidth, because the data that the system collects has to be transported by the AI of system which collects this data and processes this. The agent is very intelligent. Uh, the agent that is sitting on the servers are very intelligent and very lightweight and does not um, consume more uh, resources on the server as well as does not consume more bandwidth when it is sending the data. So the um, availability of bandwidth or the remote areas or low, band low bandwidth connection is not really a problem. Um, it can um, uh, send the data on a lower bandwidth. And there is also another solution in case if um, um, sending the data from the remote areas is um, not viable for whatever reason, the agents can sit at a central server and connect to the uh, the bandwidth is available and collect the data and use that data for the um, prediction and other use cases. So it is not a really a problem. Only thing it needs some sort of connectivity, not necessarily only um, the MPLS um, or normal internet. It can even work on uh, the wireless circuits whatever connectivity that is available right right i do agree in today's world where internet is kind of omnipresent um you know if it can work on a thin client which you are saying um, so i think that answers the question um the other question that i have is uh, you know how does it integrate with other monitoring tools that's part a and part b is how long does it take to deploy such a tool So um, as uh, Chandra, go ahead, Uday. Please go yeah, ahead. I was just going to say, as uh, Chandra and uh, Aninda are uh, talking, it looks like they have a little bit of uh, an audio issue. So let me take this question, Aninda. I think it, it, it's a two-part question. The first question is around how does Gavel integrate with all of our monitoring tools? And then I see questions around uh, time. How long did it take to deploy? How long have we used? So I'll answer the first right. question, and then I'll go to the time issue. So um, the question about uh, how does it integrate with monitoring tools, I think that's a great question. And that is really the, the anchor that drives Gavel, right? So we have, as you can imagine, 65 locations, 3,000 employees at our agency. So we have a ton of voice and data infrastructure, compute and storage uh, infrastructure. As much as we are using the cloud, we still have a lot of devices, so to speak. And all of these different devices are generating tons of alerts, tons of data. And uh, traditionally, we are all used to using different types of monitoring systems. We have a monitoring system for the network equipment. We have one for our voice, OP, voice over IP equipment. We have a different system for uh, servers and storage. And sometimes when you implement these uh, technologies, they all come with their own um, monitoring and alerting uh, systems, or we use third-party systems. So what we have done is we consolidate all of these monitoring systems that we previously had, but we were trying to analyze what was happening using each of these systems that were, in a way, siloed. So it wasn't easy for us to do correlation um, across multiple systems to understand what was going on, which is where Gavel really helped us because it does a great job of collating all of the uh, information. It does a really great job of reducing the noise uh, that is generated for the most part across all of these systems. And it does a really good job of helping us understand what is going on, whether it is root cause analysis or whether it is suggesting um, what action should be taken using its uh, predictive analytics uh, model. I'm hoping that uh, that answered the question about how Gavel integrates with the monitoring tools. Now, in terms of the time, uh, as you can imagine, this is um, something that takes a little time. It's an iterative process for us. We partnered with our, uh, um, with our uh, vendor to help 
fine tune and optimize the system. So we've been using this tool for a little over two years in our agency. Um, it took us probably about three months to deploy it because really what you have to do initially is to figure out what is the infrastructure that you want to optimize using the system, what kind of uh, data is collected or generated through the infrastructure, what kind of systems you have, and then uh, you're either installing a small thin client on the infrastructure, uh, like let's say for example on the servers that is then uh, collecting telemetry data and and uh, uh, consolidating that in Gavel, or you are connecting other systems that are collecting uh, SNMP traffic or what have you that feeds into Gavel, and then you give Gavel some time to start to figure out what is going on, and then it provides uh, insights to you. But with that said, uh, as the tool has matured and as the tool has evolved, um, I'm going to ask Chandra to talk a little bit about where there, we are now at a point uh, where this tool can be implemented even faster, and we can almost begin to see benefits almost from day one. Chandra? Yes. Uh, yes, thanks for, um, uh, for giving that comprehensive answer. Uh, okay. So now, uh, as I was talking for the, as my response to the previous one, uh, we have agents that can run on the native as well as on the remote. And we also have built connectors um, for all, almost all the popular tools that are spanning from ITSM, APM, database management, network management. Uh, Chandra, we are it losing very... you. Okay. Chandra, are you there? Um, so as, the, as we already have um, um, lots of connectors that can connect to the various systems that are there, um, in the IT environment, right from um, ITSM, APM, um, server monitoring, network monitoring, database monitoring, very quickly we can connect to the uh, existing monitoring tools in an organization. Uh, of course, provided we have the right API and uh, uh, access to connect to the database, and then we can bring up the system very quickly. Uh, just to give you, uh, for one of um, um, the prospects, or one of the customers, where there are about 20,000 alerts getting generated in a day that is coming from about uh, six plus different tools. We were able to quickly implement this tool and connect to the tools um, and collect the data and do the noise uh, event correlation, noise reduction within a flat three weeks. And uh, that's the agility that uh, um, with which the Gavel and uh, other tools can be implemented today. I think that gives us an um, idea, you know, depending of, of course, on the size of infrastructure and the type of alerts getting generated. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, they give a very comprehensive answer. I think that puts perspective. And thanks for adding in, Chandra. A um, couple of more questions. I think, Uday, this is more for you. Um, you know, says how long? So um, I uh, mentioned that earlier. We've been using this tool for uh, a little over uh, two years now. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, definitely made big differences. Um, you know, it's not easy to sometimes quantify uh, tools like this with hard numbers. Uh, if I were to sit down and uh, come up with a formula, I certainly can put a dollar figure around this tool. Uh, as you can imagine, um, and I mentioned it earlier in our uh, presentation, 60% of our annual expenses go towards uh, labor cost. Um, you know, so to be able to use tools like this, which allows us to do all the work that we are doing without necessarily adding more resources, that's a savings, right? So um, uh, you know, that's not potentially expenses that we have that we are eliminating, but that's, that means we are not incurring additional expenses that we would have otherwise had to incur. So there are many ways to justify and articulate the return on investment. Um, but, you know, but we are looking to get more out of it. I saw another question here that uh, yes. asked about, is the tool currently supporting microbiology slides and, uh, and images? So oh, yeah. I just wanted to yeah. clarify that earlier when I referred to uh, artificial intelligence is being used very successfully in the world of imaging, uh, I meant to use that as an example in general. Uh, in our agency, because we are a community-based uh, social service agency, 
we really don't deal with a lot of the traditional uh, imaging. So we are not using our tool in our agency to do any kind of uh, imaging related work. Hopefully that helps clarify. Yes, it does, I guess. Good. Um, <clears throat> Is, if there's no other questions, um, I think you know that you know, in your spiel you had on top of the questions which had come up by now. Um, if there's any other questions, you know we would request you to send an email, or if you want to speak with a GAVS representative to uh, learn more, please do send your email to inquiry i n q u i i r y at gavstech.com, and to learn more about the company, please do visit gavstech.com um, with this uh, if there's no other questions uh, coming up you know I would thank everyone for joining this web um, so um, one thing uh, I do want to apologize you know on one side we are talking about uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, you know look forward to hearing from you yes you you want to say something so in closing, uh, I just wanted to mention yeah. that on one side, we, we for the last almost an hour or so, we are talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, optimizing technology, pushing the envelope. But here we are, we can't figure out how to manage sound effectively on this conference call. So my apologies, and uh, I'm sure things will get better, and uh, we look forward to a better world and future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.